Now it's time to bring in our next guest, a personal friend of mine and good friend of the income generation, financial advisor Steve Archer, founder of Strategic Senior Benefits Group right here in beautiful Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Steve, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Dave. Before we get started, though, I want to take a minute and watch together and also have our, our viewers watch uh, this clip of my interview, part of my interview with Lawrence Kotlikoff, the father of Social Security, if you will, uh, that we did just within the last year. So, so let's play the clip, please. People are leaving uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars, depending on their circumstances, on the table because they don't understand the uh, terribly complicated uh, outrageously long number of rules or, uh, that uh, Social Security has. They don't understand the payoff from waiting till uh, 70 to start collecting your retirement benefit and uh, the payoff to wait till 66 in many cases uh, for your spousal or uh, mm -hmm. widow or benefit or divorce benefits. And uh, they also don't understand that there are about 12 different benefits that are available to you under Social Security, not just your retirement benefit, they don't, and the third thing they don't, do, do not understand is how to time your benefits to be strategic to make sure that you get as much as you can. So uh, we're trying to make sure that everybody gets what they paid for. We're not trying to bankrupt the system. The system is already bankrupt on its own. We're trying to make sure that things are fair within each generation. If we're going to change the law uh, to fix the finances, we should do that, and I recommend that. But we should not have a system where some people Get, get a whole lot more money than others just because they uh, understand the rules and the others don't. Mm -hmm. So Steve, $100,000 of additional benefits over the course of one's lifetime. And, and our viewers have heard me bounce that number around. So with all your experience as a, as a social security expert, mm -hmm. what is the largest differential, the largest amount of additional cumulative benefits that you've seen projected for individuals by taking the number one best benefit versus the number two best benefit give, given their personal situation. It's funny, that, that number is burned in my brain, Dave. Okay. Uh, the number is $212,763. 200 and, yes. wow, that's yes. a big number. It is. That's, and that's the difference between not the best and the worst, no. that's the difference between the number one best method Correct. and the number two best method. Correct. Yeah. And it's a big deal, life expectancy. You know, we hear the break even point being for most people in the early 80s or so, 80, that's 81. Right. So it is a big difference. If someone's not going to live anywhere near age 80, well, it makes a big difference to take it early. If they're going to live a lot beyond, beyond that, it makes a big difference to take it late. For sure. So if we're talking about taking it late, you know, we talk about the reduction that you get. There's a six and two thirds percent reduction for each year you take the benefits early, and there's an eight percent benefit you get for each year you delay it. But what's the, what's the difference net net between age 62 and age 70? What's the difference in terms of somebody taking at the earliest point versus the latest point? Well, if you include COLAs, which are projected at 2.8%, you're talking about doubling your, your payment. It's a doubling of the benefit from 62 to 70. Right. Yeah, it's pretty close to double, depending upon what the cost of living raises end up being. It's, mm -hmm. That's a big deal. That's right. So simple math, gosh, you know, that, that puts a break-even point closer to age 78, right? It could. It yeah, could. sure. Yep, for some folks it does. Sure. And this year... They actually did get that 2.8%. They actually got a tiny bit yes. more than that for the first time mm -hmm. in many years, didn't That's they? That's right. Yep. Wages have increased, and so the COLA followed. Now, Lawrence Kotlikoff also mentioned there are 12 different additional benefits that people aren't aware of, and we don't have time today to go over 12 of anything, but let's talk about one of those, Ben, one of those key additional benefits that you think people need to be aware of. I think that folks are surprised when they first learn of divorced spouse benefits. Mm -hmm. Um, they're a little bit surprised at how the survivor benefits work. And then the last one, which surprises almost everyone, and frankly it only covers a small percentage of the population, but if somebody's getting to 62, they're filing age, uh, they're filing age and, uh, and they have young children, they, they are also eligible for a child's benefit That's in right. addition. That's yes. right, the child is. Let, let's talk, we have 45 seconds left. Yes, sure. Tell our viewers about the survivor benefit, because that's, that's something that affects a lot of people. Well, the, the part that surprises most folks is that when you file doesn't just have to do with what benefit you'll be receiving during your life, but also has a big effect on the benefit you'll leave behind for your survivor. And that's, that's where a lot of folks get their eyes opened. Because the way it works is you get the higher, right? The higher the benefits. That's correct. 
even, even you know, if, if, if I get the higher benefit and my wife predeceases me, then, then I get to keep my benefit. But yet, if I predecease her, she gets mine and gives up hers. That's so, correct. And she gets all of your delayed retirement credits along with your primary insurance amount. So maximizing the benefit for the, the per higher benefit recipient makes sense in case of death. So right. stay with us. We need to take a commercial break. You stay with us, too. We'll be right back with more here on the Income Generation. I'm David Scranton. We'll be right back. And now it's time to welcome back Steve Archer, founder of Strategic Senior Benefits Group. Steve, thanks for sticking around. My pleasure. Uh, I have another piece that I want us to watch uh, from Dr. Lawrence Kotlikoff just over the last year or so in my interview with him, uh, and then we could talk about that in just a moment. Sure. Um, so if you could roll that next clip, please. Well, it could be, it could be as low as 500. Uh, you know, our software actually calculates the number of uh, uh, choices we look at. Uh, many are dominated, so when we say that there, we're looking at 30,000 choices, it could under you know it could really represent 25 million, but uh, a typical uh, run of our software would have 30,000 different combinations that we're actually analyzing. Great, and and that's actually gotten a, to be a smaller number because there were some methods that I understand were actually taken away just a few months ago in the month of April. Is that correct? Well, there was some uh, the ability for younger people, people under 62 on. January 2nd uh, of this year, 2016, the ability of, of those people to take just a spousal benefit at full retirement age and let, and let their own retirement benefit grow till 70, that's been taken away for those younger people. But uh, there are still a lot of people in that age range between 62, let's say, and 66, who can still uh, collect just a spousal benefit while waiting to get their own retirement benefit. Then you've got some low-income spouses who can, or divorced spouses who can still collect on their current spouse or their ex-spouse. They can still collect spousal benefits. So it's not like we've uh, eliminated spousal benefits. We've um, eliminated those for higher earning uh, spouses, but not for um, lower low-income spouses. And then you have cases where you might have a young spouse who's too young to do this, but a 64-year-old spouse who could collect now you have the question, should the young spouse at 62 take her retirement benefit early so the older spouse at 66 can collect a spousal benefit on the younger spouse's work record, and then when the younger spouse reaches 66, they can suspend their benefit and wait till 70 to take a higher number. So uh, mm -hmm. there are lots of different combinations that we, uh, we do need to consider. So, Steve, you mentioned uh, divorce benefits, yes. and Dr. Kolokoff mentioned divorce benefits. Um, tell our viewers just a little bit about how those work. Well, when a, uh, when a person's been married for more than 10 years, uh, they now can be used, their earnings record can be used for, uh, for the spouse that they've left behind. Um, and it doesn't matter how many spouses there might be. It, if there are multiple spouses that were married to this person for more than 10 years, all of them have the right to file for a spousal benefit. So you think, None of those benefits think, are reduced in any way. Maybe, think maybe that's how... You know, Zsa, Zsa Gabor was able to do it. Or get, be, be married maybe, that many times. You think maybe maybe was, the men that she was married to was possible. from it. Yes, I'm just, I'm just checking. Yeah. You know, you never know. It's possible. I'm sure she maxed out her benefits throughout her life. I would so, imagine yeah. so. You know, Liz Taylor. Yes. You have to. It's a lot logical <laughs> that's question. <true. laughs> Anyways, I digress. Go ahead. Sorry. Well, that's it. It's uh, you, you can uh, if you had a person who was uh, 70 years old. Let's say a gentleman 70 years old and. He got married for the first time at 20 years old, and he was addicted to 10-year marriages. He might have five spouses out there who were able to collect a Social Security benefit based on his earnings record. Gotcha. Odd, but it's true. Gotcha. So we have 30 seconds left in this block. What's one idea that still remains for people maximizing their benefit other than just taking it later? One strategy. Well, um, it's not always a good idea to take it late. Sometimes it's a good idea to take it early. There's a couple of instances where, where you might consider it. Okay. One is if, uh, you know, in a morbid sense, if you're not well, you, your prospects are not looking good, uh, you might want to take the benefit a little bit earlier because you may not reach that break-even point. And then the other time where you could consider it is when there's a big difference between uh, a married couple's ages. And so if you have a 10 or a 12 year or more age difference between two couple, uh, between two married individuals, you might consider it there as it well. It could make sense. It could make yep. sense. Stay with us. We have more words of wisdom here from Steve Archer right after the break. You're watching The Income Generation, and I'm David Scranton. We'll be right back.
And now it's time to welcome back for one last segment, Steve Archer. So I get it. You don't always take it late. This isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. Sometimes you take it early. It could make sense for certain people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why people need someone like you who's a social security expert. So, but why else do you think someone who's approaching retirement needs to have a qualified financial advisor helping them other than just your expertise in social security? It's a good question. I, I think a lot of people recognize the need for a financial advisor right off. Other people who have been successful doing it themselves might not readily recognize the need. For that, I would uh, I'd use the example of the harbor pilot. You know, a sea captain on average makes about $150,000 a year. But harbor pilots surprisingly earn on average about $400,000 a year. Why? Because they come, on, they come on the scene at the most critical time and have to have innate knowledge of the harbor or the river to bring that ship into port. Um, so it's a point in time where you cannot make any mistakes, otherwise the entire trip of however many miles it might have been is now gone to pot. Mm -hmm. Good analogy. I like that. Mm -hmm. so, how do, so how do you, how can you tell? Like what, what, what types of investment strategies do you utilize that are different for someone who's approaching retirement in your practice versus just somebody who's in their 30s or 40s who's still accumulating? Well, again, this is not a blanket statement and it's not one size fits all, but a couple of items that are, that are important to look at as you approach retirement is, for the money that you expect to draw an income from, you'd like to know that you won't have to sell any shares in order to have money in your hand on a monthly or a quarterly basis, however you draw your money. Um, and keep in mind that most people would agree they wouldn't want to invade their principal. However, what they might not recognize is that the shares that they own, whether it's a mutual fund or an individual security, the shares that they own actually represent their principal. So if you have to sell shares at all, you are automatically invading principal. There's one item. Another is that it's really important to take inflation into consideration. Mm -hmm. Fact is, is that even if inflation is only projected at 3%, if you have a $5,000 a month budget today, in only 10 years, it's going to be over $7,000. And, and, and the issue, though, is why is it that some boat captains don't even realize that they need that extra level of expertise to be a harbor pilot? Um, you've talked about the difference, but some, some financial advisors don't really understand that. They think, you know, well, I'm a boat captain. I've got plenty of years of experience. I can take this boat right in the harbor. Mm -hmm. Why don't yep. they realize it? It's mainly it's confidence and hubris. Mm -hmm. Yep, that would do it. So in the last 30 seconds or so we have left, tell our viewers how they could determine whether they're, they're coming that harbor, that final approach to dock their boat into retirement, how they can tell whether they're talking to an average run-of-the-mill boat captain or whether they're talking to a harbor pilot. Well, a person who is specializing in retirement planning and more importantly, investing for income will speak more about dividends and interest than about growth, obviously. And he will put a portfolio together, he or she will put a portfolio together that will generate an income from investments sufficient to maintain a person's standard of living without the need to depend on capital appreciation inside that portfolio. Good words of advice. As my good buddy Greg always says, he says, eat the eggs, not the chicken. If you eat the correct. eggs, the chicken will lay more eggs. That's so it right. uh, makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense. Steve, thanks so much for being here today. Really appreciate it. It's been my pleasure. All right, and you stay with us. We have more here on the Income Generation. We'll be right back.